Friends, our sermon text this morning is 1 Kings 17, uh, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 6. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. This is the word of the Lord. G'day, brothers. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we uh, pray that you'll be with us as we turn to your word. Give us uh, ears to hear and eyes to see so that we might um, know you and follow you more closely. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, years ago, um, there was an ad on TV for the news. Um, I didn't really watch the news, but I liked the ad. Um, And the ad basically starts with a woman in a car stopped at the lights. She turns around uh, to reach for something in the back seat. And as she looks through the back windscreen, uh, she sees a man in the car behind and he's waving and shouting at her um, as if she's missed the green light or something. And then she keeps looking and he gets more and more aggressive and agitated. And then suddenly he bursts out of his car and charges at her. And she is absolutely petrified as he rips open a door, drags her kicking and screaming from the car, and the ad fades to black. But then a caption comes up on the screen. Make sure you see the bigger picture. And then the scene is replayed, except this time the camera pans back, and you see that while the woman's back is turned, smoke has started to rise from the hood of her car, and then it turns into flames. And once you know the bigger picture you see the real situation. He's not a road rager. He's desperately trying to warn her. He's not mugging her. He's saving her. Uh, In these last few weeks of term, I want us to look at the prophet Elijah. He is a very striking and important figure, um, but he also does some things that seem very strange and harsh. But when you pull back and see the bigger picture, I think his words and actions suddenly make a whole lot more sense and show us some huge things about God's plan to save the world from sin. And so uh, I think Elijah is someone that I keep on returning to every now and again, and every time I do, I just seem to get more and more out of uh, his narrative. So let's uh, have a look at it. Now let me set the context for you, 1 Kings 17. Uh, At the moment, things are not looking so good for God's people, and so you'll see there's a map coming up. Um, And basically, uh, at this stage, the kingdom has been divided, and north and south Israel and Judah are at war with each other, and also with the nations around And so there's been incredible instability in the people of God and their experience, especially in the northern kingdom, Israel, where Elijah is prophesying. I think there's some arrows. Yes, there's Judah. Oh, sorry, that's Israel and that's Judah. Uh, mm -hmm. (laughs) So in their 70-year history so far, Israel were up to their fourth dynasty, the Omrides. And uh, two of those dynasty changes were by assassination and one was by suicide. So things were incredibly unstable, and life was just very insecure. But actually, under Ahab, who was Omri's son, uh, things seemed to be uh, turning the corner, going pretty well. And so both Omri and Ahab had very long reigns, and so that made life stable and secure. Ahab went and married the Sidonian princess Jezebel, that's the arrow up the top, which meant that Israel now had trade links to a major world power, And he also negotiated peace with Judah. In fact, Israel became uniquely prosperous under Ahab. Life felt pretty good. But against this rosy outlook, one king sees things very differently. Uh, From God's perspective, yes, Ahab was uniquely significant as a king. In fact, he gets the last six chapters of one king's, almost a quarter of the book. But he is not uniquely significant in a good way, because in chapter 16, verse 30 we see Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. 
And why? Verse 31. He not only considered it trivial to, con to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. See, as bad as all the other kings of Israel were, Ahab is unique because he is the first king to openly defy Israel's own God. And in 1 Kings 17 and following, he pretty much launches an all-out attempt to erase Yahweh from Israel and replace him with the Baal Jezebel had packed in a suitcase. And so Elijah's ministry, which also coincides uh, with the end of 1 Kings, comes in the context of great opposition to biblical truth and biblical faith. So there's a lot of parallels between Elijah and ourselves. And so let's listen carefully to what God has to say to us through this. And I've got three points from 1 Kings 17. We're going to cover the whole chapter. Uh, God's word sustains the world. God's word brings grace to the unlikely. And God's word brings life to the dead. So first, God's word sustains the world. Verses 1 to 6. Uh, verse 1, just when everything in Israel seems to be going to the dogs, bang, Elijah appears without warning and marches up to Ahab and says, as Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So with a word, he bursts Israel's prosperity bubble and plunges them into a national emergency. Uh, we Aussies know how deadly drought is. Um, one Aussie writer said of the recent New South Wales droughts, farming is like a cup of soup. Just add water and everything is okay. No water, not okay. Drought equals destruction and ruin of our land, our animals, our incomes, our families. And in an agrarian society like ancient Israel, where life depended so transparently on being able to grow the food you ate, Drought gives you a very simple but chilling sequence. Drought, famine, hopelessness, death. And this was God's judgment for Ahab leading his people away from his word to worship Baal. But it's important to say that this wasn't a random punishment, uh, like, I don't know, a parent who can't control his kids shouting in desperation, all right, then no TV for the next few years, or anything like that. Now, there are two reasons why God's judgment here takes the form of a drought. Uh, the first one is because God already told them that's what would happen. The covenant curse in Deuteronomy 28 spelt out the consequence of rejecting the God whose commands brought the rains to bless the earth. But the second reason is actually the key one in this context, and that is because Baal was the Canaanite god of storms and rain, and therefore fertility and prosperity. And so here's a carving of one particular Baal, and you can see there he's holding a um, thunderbolt spear, which turns into a tree as it hits the ground. And so Baal worship actually offered very similar, similar blessings to what Yahweh promised his people in Deuteronomy, but simply at a massively reduced cost. No all-of-life obedience, no serving others above yourself, no hard yards of putting God first. A uh, few simple rules, a couple of ceremonies, a few payments to keep Baal happy, health, wealth can be yours. And so Elijah's declaration of drought really struck at the heart of Baal's claim to bring rain and fertility and life. And in fact, 1 Kings 17 to 19 um, are written as something of a battle between Yahweh and Baal, kind of like a walk-off or something like that, to determine who the true God really is. But each episode in these chapters actually shows it's not really a battle at all. It's just a demonstration of how stupid it is to follow anyone or anything but Yahweh. It is an object lesson for Israel in the need to hang their lives on nothing but the word of God. And that actually explains the somewhat surprising turn the narrative takes immediately in verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Carith Ravine, east of the Jordan, 
you'll drink from the brook, and I've directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Carith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. So pretty much straight after Elijah's declaration in verse 1, he does a mic drop, runs, and just disappears. Uh, now why? Well, some people think it's because Ahab and Jezebel got really mad and tried to kill him, and there's probably some truth to that, but I don't think that's actually the main reason. I don't think this is like Elijah egging a house and then bolting so he doesn't get caught, um, or as another commentator put it, uh, the Carith Ravine is not the safe house in Yahweh's witness protection program. No, it's because Elijah is God's prophet who brings his word to his people. And so his withdrawal means the absence of God's word from his people. It's not so much an act of fear as an act of judgment that goes hand in hand with verse 1. As serious as the drought of rain was, it was just an illustration of something even more terrifying, and that is a drought of God's word. Uh, the Bible always treats the silence of God as agonising, as death itself. And when you stop and think about it, that's exactly right, isn't it? Uh, Colossians 1.16 says about Jesus, in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. Brothers, we've got to remember, we exist and live each moment only because God wills every single beat of our hearts. Without his sustaining word, there is no life. And if Israel hardened their hearts against God by chasing after Baal, they would reap what they sowed. No word, no life. And sometimes it takes a crisis to expose the truth, doesn't it? Um, so, uh, in some ways, the drought is actually not just a punishment. It's also a loving wake-up call. Uh, it's a bit like God's hammer designed to smash through the walls of Israel's stubborn hearts and the facade that Baal could give them life to lead them back to him. And as I think about that challenge, it's a good one for us as well, isn't it? Because here we are at Theological College, soaking ourselves in the study of God's Word. And yet how often, on brief reflection, can I think of areas in which I neglect God's Word? I forsake God's Word. And sometimes, in my utter foolishness, I even think I can live in defiance of God's Word without consequence. And so if that is you as well, then verses 1 to 6, God is saying to you this morning, wake up, come to your senses, come back to God's word, and find true life in him alone. Now, the second point the passage makes from verses 7 to 16 is that God's word brings grace to the unlikely. And so uh, Elijah hanging out at Carith Brook, in verse 7, the brook dries up, and he is now given a new word from God. Go once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. Now, in the context of Middle Eastern hospitality, uh, what he asked for isn't much at all. But in verse 12, we read about this widow's desperate situation. And you've got to remember, in the ancient world, there was no Centrelink, there was no pension social welfare program, and so to be a widow was pretty much to be destitute. And therefore, in a drought, you pretty much had no chance. And so this widow is down to her last handful of flour and oil, just enough to bake a little bread roll for her, her and her son to eat before they wait to die. It's a situation of total hopelessness. But it's also a situation of total irony. See, it's all taking place, verse 9, in Zarephath of Sidon, which is where Jezebel is from. This is Baal's hometown. So here is this widow in Baal Central, and yet she is at death's doorstep because there's been no rain and no crops. 
And the implication should be clear. Baal, great rain god he is, can't even get a drop to fall on his own turf. So Elijah says to her in verse 13, don't be afraid, go and do as you have said, but first make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and for your son, for this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. The flour jar will not become empty and the oil jug will not run dry until the day Yahweh sends rain on the surface of the land. And so this section raises the key question for us again. Israel will not hang their life on God's word, but will this pagan widow, will this subject of Baal, hang all she has and her entire life on nothing but the word of the God of Israel. Verse 15, she does. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of Yahweh spoken by Elijah. And so what we have in this passage is that in the midst of drought, this widow, a pagan nobody that no one would have expected the God of Israel to reach out to, finds her life sustained by his gracious word. And so the point should be clear that there is no one outside the scope of salvation. No one too low no one too far away, no one too ungodly, no one too broken or evil to be undeserving of the gospel of God's mercy. Isn't that what makes our gospel so wonderful? Now, we know this, don't we? We're preparing to do this for our lifetimes. But it is so challenging to live out, isn't it? Evangelism can be really hard and emotionally distressing. And let's face it, you can often feel like an absolute goose trying to bring up the gospel with someone, can't you? But uh, let me offer you some encouragement to keep going and keep looking for and taking whatever opportunity you can to tell others about the gospel. Uh, Because I myself can testify about the impact of God's grace to the unlikely. So my great-great-grandpa was converted in the late 1800s by the equivalent of a walk-up evangelist. Uh, Basically, he's a bit of a prodigal son, so he squandered his family fortune by drinking and gambling... And he was disowned and ended up living on the streets. One day, he wandered past a street preacher, and because he had nothing better to do, he listened. The next day, he came back, listened again, and then gave his life to the Lord. Uh, In fact, he became a street preacher himself and ended up being martyred for it. Uh, But because of him, Christianity has run strong in my family for generations, uh, flowing down through my mum, who was the one who led me to Christ as a kid. Now, I'll be honest with you, I hate the idea of street preaching. All right? I get embarrassed if I'm walking in the city and you see one, and my internal dialogue is something like, oh, man, wish you'd stop, man. You're just making Christians look like crackpots. And then I think, shut up, you idiot. <laughs> I am so thankful for that turkey who decided to stand, that, stand up that day and tell anyone who would listen about the Lord Jesus. Yeah, most people probably walked straight past him. Many probably ridiculed him. But he just kept on doing it. And for me, it's so wonderful that he did. I don't think he would have any idea of the impact of his preaching on my life or those in my extended family who are Christians more than 100 years later. But without his preaching, we might have never known the grace of God. So, brothers, let me encourage you and challenge you. Evangelism's hard. I find it very difficult. But God shows us in this passage he's extending his powerful, gracious word to the most unlikely of people. And in his sovereign grace, those who you may least expect, whom he has chosen, will respond and hang their life on his word. And, fellas, if you needed any more convincing of this, Just have a look around this room, which is full of unlikely people to whom God's grace has been extended. It is never in vain to offer life to those whose only other option is death. So keep at it. Now, in uh, verses 17 to 24, we come to the final scene in the chapter, verse 17. Sometime later, 
the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What have you against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Uh, The turn in the narrative just seems so cruel, doesn't it? God graciously rescued them from death by drought, only to engulf her son in death itself. And again, you have to ask the question, what is God doing here? Why did God allow this? I think that's a bit of an existential question for us too, isn't it? You know, have you ever asked that? I have. Why God? Why? Things were going so well. Why am I now in this situation? Why have you let this happen to me and to those I love? And at one level, we've got to be prepared to accept we may not ever get the answers that we want. God gives, God takes away. It is completely his prerogative. But he also tells us it is right for us to cry out to him in our grief. And in his sovereign goodness, he uses even tragedy and our cries to him to answer for our ultimate good. Uh, In C.S. Lewis's famous words reflecting on the death of his wife. He says, we can ignore pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And you can see that in verse 18, where the widow asks, did you come here to remind me of my sin? So God may use tragedy and hardship because he needs to wake us up to addressing our sin. But in this passage, there's actually a lot more going on. That is, I think, one of the key reasons God allows this situation to happen and he allows the widow's son to die is in order to reveal more of his great plan to save the world from sin and death. You see, again, in context, Canaanite mythology had a way of explaining drought and famine. So if the rains didn't come, it was because once a year... Uh, Baal had a fight with the god of death, Mut, and he always lost. And as a result, he became bound helplessly in the underworld. And so what happened was his sister, Anat, had to go and negotiate his release with Mut. Actually, negotiate is a bit of a loose term. Uh, What Anat does is she stabs Mut with a knife, uh, shreds him through a sieve, burns him in fire, grinds him with a millstone and scatters his remains over a field for the birds to devour. Nasty piece of work, Anat, but handy sister to have (laughs) if you ever get yourself in trouble. Now, when Baal was rescued, the rains would return until he had another fight with Mot next year, which he would lose again, and so the cycle would continue. So when the widow's son died, it raised a new level of challenge, I guess, for Yahweh. That is, he may be able to sustain life, sure, but can he do anything when death has actually claimed its victim? You know, does Yahweh, like Baal, have to bend the knee when faced with death? And so one king shows us beyond the shadow of a doubt that Yahweh is not death's subject like Baal. He is death's Lord. God's word can not only sustain life, it can overcome death itself. See, in the end, Baal is not the issue for Yahweh. Baal is child's play. I mean, according to his own mythology, he can't even beat death for himself. But the word of Yahweh, the God of Israel, can, because he is the one true God. And so the raising of this boy, which is the first resurrection miracle in the Bible, moves us beyond the immediate confrontation with Baal to the very heart of God's plans, and that is to conquer death itself. And remember how death entered the world? The serpent led Adam and Eve away from trusting in God's word, and as a result, the world was plunged into death. And so here in 1 Kings 17, what we see is a mini-reversal of the fall. The widow trusts the word of God. Verse 24, Now I know that you are a man of God, And that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. And death itself is overcome. But of course, that's not just the main point of this passage. It's the main point of the whole Bible. 
And so this passage in the end points us to another son swallowed up by death, not because he was helpless, but on our behalf, so that he could enter death and then personally rip it apart from the inside to free us from its grip forever. It's the Lord Jesus. All right, so what do we get from this? Well, I think there's so much to learn from uh, 1 Kings 17. And uh, I think one thing is to just recognise the Christian life is always going to be challenging. But I think we see, particularly in Elijah's ministry, what, uh, uh, what living for Christ in, an, in a context of open defiance and rejection of Yahweh and his word looks like. And so uh, way back in 1928, I think quite reminiscent of uh, uh, Ahab's time as well, but way back in 1928, G.K. Chesterton wrote, these are the days when the Christian is expected to praise every creed except his own. And uh, if I may say, just like uh, Chesterton's 1928 hairdo is so right again in 2021, (laughs) so are his words. Uh, As remember, brothers, here in this context, we're really normal with each other, and it's kind of cool to be Christian. But let's face it, increasingly in our context, being Christian just makes us look weird and strange to others. And it's pretty hard to miss the message of those around us that they think the word of the God of Israel is outdated, offensive, and not worth having. And so we've got to remember that entrusting ourselves to God's word in seeking to serve others with God's word may well bring us rejection, persecution, and suffering. And it may be very real and very painful, as it is for so many of our brothers and sisters around the world. But 1 Kings 17 teaches us to see the world not through those eyes, but as it truly is. God's word alone sustains life. God's word alone brings grace to the unlikely. God's word alone brings life to the dead. It is worth every bit of effort and hardship it may bring, including, may I say in the lead up to exams, your theological study here. So make sure every aspect of your life and ministry hangs on nothing but the word of God. Let's pray. Father, in this sinful world, there are so many competitors for our affections and for first place in our hearts. Father, for us individually, we acknowledge them and bring them to you, whether they are Baals or whether they are more subtle idols. Father, please remind us from this passage of that stark call that without your word, there is no life. But with your word, there is life eternal. And please use that to fuel us and empower us for a lifetime of looking to you and serving others with your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.